This episode is brought to you by Pete's. Few things start your day better than a good coffee. That's why Pete's hand roast their coffee from a specific selection of high quality beans. And they don't just put those beans into anyone's hands. Pete's trains their roasters for 10,000 hours so they can master the roast that gives you the most. Pete's Coffee. Coffee for coffee people. Find Pete's online or at your local retailer. Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning. This episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, friends, later this week, I will be at CrimeCon in Orlando, and I am so thrilled to be with all my friends on Podcast Row. I can't wait to meet any and all of my listeners who will be in attendance. And I am so excited to meet all the new people who will be finding this show for the first time after this episode airs. To all my new and old listeners alike, I say welcome. Today's story is a listener suggested case. At this point, all of my cases are listener suggested and the list grows weekly. But this one was recommended a while back and it resurfaced when it was recommended again. A case that really makes you wonder, Do you really know your partner? And should courts really take your good military record into consideration when considering an appropriate sentence for a heinous crime? Join me today as I tell you the tragic story of Yvonne Baldelli. Now, let's dig in. In the fall of 2011, 42-year-old Yvonne Baldelli and her boyfriend, 39-year-old Brian Brimager, set out to Panama from their life in California. They left behind the U.S. in the hopes to settle into a quieter life in Panama. They picked the country due to its low cost of living and the pull of living the beach life. The couple started dating back in 2009 after Yvonne divorced her first husband. After Yvonne and Brian began dating, she became aware that Brian was still married and had been dating other women. So Yvonne actually wrote Brian's wife a letter and told her everything that was going on. When they met, Yvonne was working in management for Procter & Gamble and Brian was an active duty Marine. But in the years since they met, as reported by Crime Online, they continued an on again, off again, pretty much toxic relationship. At one point, Yvonne got laid off and Brian divorced his wife and left the Marine Corps. Some articles indicate he retired, but everything says he served only eight years. While it's possible he was medically retired, none of the articles specifically mention that. At that point in their lives, when they were both unemployed and single, apparently, Brian swooped in and during one of their on periods and during a very pivotal point in life, he mentioned leaving everything behind, moving to Panama and living as expats. Yvonne leaped at the opportunity to start a fresh new life away from all the drama. An expat, by the way, is someone who lives or works in a country that's not the one they have citizenship in. So with Panama in sight, Yvonne sold off all of her earthly possessions. She packed some clothes, two expensive sewing machines, and her beloved dog, Georgia May. She also packed her white Sony Vio laptop since it was going to be her primary means to communicate with her family back in the States. The goal once they got to Panama was for Brian to become a singer and play the guitar in different restaurants and bars. And Yvonne wanted to make and sell bikinis to all the beach tourists. The couple settled on living on Isla Caranero, which is a small island on the Caribbean side of Panama near Bocas del Toro. The island is remote and you can only get there by boat. Yvonne communicated with her family frequently by phone and email and she painted a picture of perfection. She once wrote an email to her sister, Michelle Valenzuela, who shared it with 48 Hours. And this email said, quote, Hi, sis. Brian's already working at local restaurants and bars. We love it. We wake up and go running, then swim in the ocean every morning, end quote. Brian and Yvonne were really living the expat life, living in a hostel, living and being among the community. The hostel manager or owner, I'm not sure which one, 
But this person loved and trusted the couple, even allowing them to look over the place while she was at the hospital after an accident. Life seemed great. And then one day, the hostel manager got a message from Brian that he bought her a new mattress because the dog peed on it and he couldn't clean it. And then she got a message from Yvonne that said that Yvonne was moving to Costa Rica. But Yvonne told the hostel manager that she was leaving her very nice sewing machines behind for the owner to keep. Sounds good. Expats in their new journey to living in a new community can just pick up and leave. So I guess it was what it was. For the first two months living in Panama, Yvonne was sending regular emails to her family and she was calling them on the phone. But right around the Thanksgiving holiday, the emails and calls slowed down. Then they stopped altogether. Yvonne's big sister, Michelle, well, she started to feel like something was wrong. Why had Michelle just suddenly stopped calling? Weeks went by with nothing from Yvonne. When out of the blue, on December 14th, Michelle received a text message but it wasn't a number she recognized. The text message read, quote, this is Brian. May I make arrangements to pick up my truck? End quote. Wait, what? Why was Brian back in the States and where the hell was Yvonne? Michelle immediately called the number. And when Brian answered, Michelle demanded to know where her sister was. Brian didn't answer and asked Michelle if she got his email. Michelle said, no, I didn't get your email, but where's my sister? I haven't heard from her in a while. Michelle told Brian she would call him right back after checking her computer. Michelle went back to her email and she found an email from Brian that she had missed. The email said, hey, I'm sure you've heard by now that Vani and I are no longer together. After reading this message, Michelle was shocked. She called Brian back and was like, what the hell happened with you two? That was when Brian dropped a bombshell. He told Michelle that Yvonne had left him because she found out that he impregnated another woman while they were dating. Now, this woman was still in the United States. This is the skinny. Yvonne and Brian started dating back in 2009. This baby was born in 2010, and it was now late 2011. Michelle heard this news, and she was flabbergasted. She knew that Yvonne would be pissed at hearing the startling news. And she knew that Yvonne really wanted a baby, but due to a medical condition, she would never birth a child. By the way, Brian had this baby with his ex-girlfriend, Kristen. Kristen and Brian met when Kristen was working as a White House staffer and Brian was still a Marine at the time. Michelle told Brian to come and get his truck. But she did say, when you get here, I want you to come to the police station with me so that we can report Yvonne missing. Michelle went back to her computer and searched again. And this time she saw an email she had overlooked from Yvonne. The email said, hi, sis. Just an update, Brian and I are no longer together. I should have trusted my instincts that he is a lying, cheating asshole. I'm headed to Costa Rica with a man I met when we first got to Bocas. This email didn't sit right with Michelle. She knew Yvonne would have been heartbroken over the thought of Brian having a baby with another woman. According to Michelle, all Yvonne ever wanted to do was be a mother. When Brian showed up at Michelle's house to pick up his truck, he was in a hurry. So he just got his stuff and left. As reported by Crime Online, he told Michelle to hold off on reporting Yvonne missing, claiming that he would try to reach out to her. And wouldn't you know it, on the same day that he showed up to Michelle's house to pick up his things, Michelle and her parents received another email from Yvonne. This email read, Miss you and everyone at home. I'm starting to get a little homesick. I'm working on plans to get home as early as the second week of January. I've been living with cliffhangers for a while. Love you, sis, Yvonne. After this email, Yvonne's emails stopped again. More than two weeks went by without any word from Yvonne, and Michelle wrote an email to her missing sister. The subject line was worried. The email read, I just want to make sure you weren't kidnapped or someone was pretending to be you. Ha <laughs> ha. There's my paranoid, suspicious mind, or maybe too many 48 hours. Well, that was the last email that Michelle sent to her sister, and the family did not hear anything else from Yvonne. They held out hope, however, that Yvonne would make it home like the last email they received had said. Meanwhile, Brian received an email from a buddy. Their friend asked Brian to tell Yvonne he said hello, thinking he was still in Panama with her, but Brian responded to the email by writing that he, quote, ditched that b- 
The second week of January came and went and Yvonne never returned home, despite a pre-planned large family gathering. Neither Michelle or her parents had heard anything from her and Michelle's gut told her that Yvonne never left Panama. Michelle contacted one of her tech-savvy cousins, who was really a wizard. She wanted to see if he would be able to track down the source of the emails that supposedly came from Yvonne. The cousin researched the emails and determined the IP address on those emails that supposedly had come from Panama and Costa Rica had actually come from Dana Point, California. This cousin dug a little deeper and discovered that the emails that Brian sent concerning his truck had also come from, you guessed it, Dana Point, California. All the emails came from the same exact IP address. It appeared that Brian had hacked into Yvonne's email account and had been impersonating her. After this discovery, the family felt the dread move in. Their instinct told them that Yvonne probably wasn't alive anymore. Michelle brought her computer evidence down to the FBI and met with special agent Andrew Masters. The IP information that Michelle showed him told him that there was foul play involved. The FBI opened an investigation into Yvonne's disappearance and special agent Masters took the lead. But this family wasn't going to just sit back and wait for information. Yvonne's stepmom Lillian, who had been her stepmother since she was 14 years old, She contacted the State Department to see if they could track Yvonne's movements through her passport. And what she learned settled that dreadful feeling even deeper. The State Department did not have any record of Yvonne leaving Panama, and there was no record of Yvonne ever, ever entering Costa Rica. Upon learning this news, Yvonne's dad, Jim, along with Lillian, Michelle, and other family members, They jumped on an airplane and traveled to Panama to begin their very own search for Yvonne. When they arrived, they did hire a private investigator by the name of Don Winner. Don is a former intel officer who helped find and put away three different serial killers in Panama. I guess it's safe to say that if you need to find someone in Panama, Don is your go-to guy. Right off the bat, Don didn't believe the story that Brian had given to Yvonne's family. He knew that Yvonne hadn't run off with some dude in Costa Rica. Don's plan was to pressure the Panamanian government to do more to find Yvonne. He also had Jim and Michelle give blood samples just to have on file for DNA tests might they be needed in the future. With the added pressure on the government, the Panamanian police finally took some action. They announced that Yvonne was the victim of foul play and that Brian Brimager was the prime suspect. Yvonne's family printed missing persons flyers and they canvassed the area looking for any clues. Organized search teams were formed and they fanned out looking for Yvonne's remains. Her body could have been dumped absolutely anywhere. The door to their hostel was literally feet from the water. Authorities had to wonder, did Brian dump her in the ocean? Did he dump her in the jungle? FBI divers searched the water near the hostel where Brian and Yvonne had been living but they didn't find any clues. Now, real quickly, there is a creepy like true crime tie-in to this true crime story. The hostel where Brian and Yvonne had been living was once owned by an American serial killer who was dubbed Wild Bill Hulbert. Wild Bill killed at least five American expats. He buried them on the property and then, well, you'll have to hear the rest of this story. Myrtle and I are thinking of doing a mini episode on that case, even though it's not a military case. So stay tuned. So while in Panama, Yvonne's family and the search teams walked deep into the swampy jungle. Imagine the family trudging through rancid water and muck, dodging all kinds of jungle creatures like spiders and snakes, just to name a few. During their search, they found a purse, a medicine bottle, and they even discovered a U.S. passport but none of the items belonged to Yvonne. Lillian, Yvonne's stepmom, she was conflicted. She really wanted to find her daughter Yvonne, but she didn't want to be the one to actually find her dead in a swamp, which I totally get. Meanwhile, back in California, Special Agent Masters was finally ready to bring Brian Bremiger in for questioning, or at least they would go to him. On March 21st, 2012, 
Agents went to Brian's home where he was watching his daughter. Yes, the daughter that he had with Kristen when he was supposedly in love with Yvonne. Agents questioned Brian for four hours, grilling him and trying to get him to break and confess to having something to do with Yvonne's disappearance or her murder. But Brian held fast to his story that Yvonne left him for another man and moved to Costa Rica. Brian claimed that he came home and found a note from Yvonne that said that she was going to Costa Rica with a man she had been talking to. And the note also said, F you, asshole. Upon hearing this story, Special Agent Masters looked at Brian. And then Masters told Brian, well, listen, how do you explain all this IP address evidence? Why were you sending emails on Yvonne's email account from your computer? Brian, well, he wasn't even phased by this confrontation. He simply said, "Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. Come on, Brian. The IP address was coming from your house. How else did the emails get sent if it wasn't you sending them? Are you hiding Yvonne in a closet somewhere? Special Agent Masters spotted something on a table while he was visiting Brian's apartment. It was a white Sony Vio laptop, the same kind of laptop and color that Yvonne had taken with her to Panama. Brian, being the big fat liar that he was, told the FBI agents that this laptop had never been in Panama and that he had never impersonated Yvonne. Okay, all right, cool. Well, despite the email and IP address evidence, the FBI didn't have enough to arrest Brian Bremiger for Yvonne's murder just yet. And because they didn't want to move too quickly, Brian was able to live free and go golfing every day while his wife worked. Oh, yes, I said wife. You see, after Brian returned from Panama, he married his baby mama, Kristen. Here's how all that went down. This dirtbag, I mean, I guess you guys don't really know he's a dirtbag yet. Although, you know, he is. He was married and had three million girlfriends. Anyway, this dirtbag proposed to Kristen within days of Yvonne's disappearance. Two weeks after he got back to California, they got married. To commemorate their marriage, they hired a photographer to take pictures of them on the beach in California. The pictures weren't taken on their wedding day. They spontaneously, however, hired a photographer, got dressed up on some random day and went to the beach. According to the photographer, they rolled up in a limo drinking champagne. Kristen wore a beautiful wedding dress and Brian wore a khaki. I think it was khaki or maybe it was gray, but he wore a khaki suit with an open collared shirt under the jacket. The pictures showed a couple deeply in love and smiling, but Brian was harboring a secret. I am as faithful a person as they come. When I find something I love, I hold on with dear life. If you're wondering what I mean, just imagine I have had the same hairdresser for 20 years. 20 years. That means that even though I have lived in eight different states and one other continent, I always go back to my hairstylist in New Jersey. That's how faithful I am. So it's not surprising that when I found Honey Love and all they have to offer, I went ham. I have their bras, their shapewear, and even their skinny jeans because this girl has got to look good this summer. Honey Love has got my attention. Well, I wanted to tell you all about their bras. I am over the moon obsessed with Honey Love's V-Bra because it offers the support of a traditional bra, but without that uncomfortable underwire. The Honey Love V-Bra is designed to lift and separate because we were not created for uniboobs, okay? When I wear my V-Bra, I enjoy the smoothness effect that it adds to my back while also lifting the ladies so they are nice and at attention. Not only am I obsessed with my V-Bra, but I like to pair my Honey Love jeans with the Honey Love crossover cami. The what? It's a tank top that has a built-in bra guaranteed to make you feel like a goddess. Like back in the day when bras were optional. Yeah, that feeling. You definitely need to check out Honey Love. Treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash militarymama. Use my exclusive link to get 20% off your order by visiting honeylove.com slash military mama. By using this link, you are not only showing yourself some love, but you're also supporting this show. So get to shopping. Cinched, snatched, and lifted. It's still hot girl summer thanks to Honey Love. 
It's official. All the kids are back at school and holy moly, is it just me or when the kids start back at school, they just want to eat mac and cheese and chicken nuggets? Why fight it? Let them eat it. But what do you eat every night when they're eating mac and cheese? Well, let me tell you, Factor Meals. Factor Meals is better than having a chef at home because you get already prepared meals delivered directly to your doorstep and ready in two minutes. Factor has already saved my life since school got started. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meals that will help you save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. No more chopping, prepping, and cleanup with Factor Meals. Factor offers meals that taste great, but they help you level up your game. If you need more protein, they offer Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. Trying to watch what you eat but need help? They offer dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with roughly 550 calories per serving. They even offer lunch to go, which are effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad that do not require a microwave. So you can eat them right away when you're ready and on the go. Hello, car line and after school activity pickup. Factor really does offer the assist this fall as you try to handle all the things school and work throw at you right before the holidays. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your doorstep. Head to factormeals.com slash militarymama50 and use my code militarymama50 to get 50% off your order. That's code militarymama50 at factormeals.com slash militarymama50 to get 50% off. Run, don't walk to get 50% off your already prepared meals for you. Anyway, the FBI was able to obtain a warrant to search that white Sony Vio laptop that was seen in Brian's apartment in March. And when they searched it, they found some very disturbing evidence. The first piece of evidence gathered from Yvonne's laptop were two internet searches on how to remove blood from a mattress. Those searches occurred after Yvonne spoke to her family for the very last time. Most disturbingly, however, was a selfie that Yvonne took with the camera on the laptop. In the picture, Yvonne showed a close-up of her left eye that was covered by a huge black bruise. The picture showed that her left cheek was swollen as well. Yvonne was clearly documenting being battered. The picture lined up with what Don Winner was learning while he was doing his investigation down in Panama. You see, one of the bar owners down in Panama told Don that he saw bruises on Yvonne's face firsthand. The bar owner remembered seeing Yvonne with bruises and black eyes, and he told 48 Hours how he felt about Brian Bremiger. He said, quote, to me, he was a scary person. He was not the kind of person I wanted to be around. The FBI interviewed everyone in Brian's life, including his wife, Kristen. Special Agent Masters asked Kristen what Brian had told her about Panama. Kristen said that Brian told her that he was going down to Panama to decompress after leaving the Marine Corps. When Special Agent Masters asked Kristen if she had given Brian an ultimatum to leave Yvonne, Kristen was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I had absolutely no idea that Yvonne even existed. Now let that sink in. Brian had never told Kristen about Yvonne. And ladies and gents, just like that, most cheaters and liars, well, the two people in the cheater's life, they typically have no idea about one another because the lies run so deep. The cheating narcissist is always going on soul-searching journeys, always sleeping in their cars, always trying to find themselves alone. The sad truth of the matter is that they aren't doing any such thing They are just taking time to be with the other person. So Yvonne had left her entire life in California behind to go to Panama, not realizing that Brian had fathered a child during their relationship with his ex-girlfriend, who was really still his girlfriend, who thought he was just taking a breather in Panama. Kristen was at home birthing a child while her baby daddy was decompressing. She didn't realize that he was really there with another woman. Brian was, like I said, mostly unemployed and golfed full time back in California. Kristen was the family's breadwinner and worked for a defense contractor. Somehow, Kristen believed that Brian was just the greatest catch ever, even though he was nothing more than a deadbeat washed up Marine. And sadly, Kristen continued to believe that Brian was a catch. 
she stuck with him even after finding out that he had an entire second life going on in Panama with another woman. But wait, Kristen stayed even after she learned that Brian was under suspicion of murdering Yvonne. Listen, if I could offer any life advice, it is this. Some of y'all need to run, not walk when you see a red flag like this. Another person that the FBI interviewed was the hostel manager. The hostel manager told investigators that about a month before Yvonne disappeared, she, meaning Yvonne, came knocking on the manager's door asking for a key to her room. Yvonne was very upset and she was crying and she told the manager that she and Brian had gotten into an argument at a local bar. Yvonne told the hostel manager that Brian followed her out into the street and tried to strangle her. The hostel manager recalled another incident two weeks before Yvonne disappeared. And just so you know, the manager's room shared a wall with Brian and Yvonne's room. The manager, two weeks prior, could hear banging and what she believed was the sound of Yvonne being slammed against the wall. She could also hear Yvonne crying. And at one point, she heard a crash. She also heard the sound of a dog yelping and then Yvonne screaming in pain. By the way, it's unclear what the hostel manager did, but it doesn't appear that this incident was ever reported to authorities. The following day, according to the hostel manager, Brian and Yvonne's blinds stayed closed all day and Yvonne never came out. However, the day after that, Brian and Yvonne went to an event together where the hostel manager and a few other witnesses saw that Yvonne had a very visible black eye and bruises on her arms. This timing lines up with the pictures that investigators found on Yvonne's laptop showing the black eye, the swelling, the bruising, and the pictures were digitally timestamped on November 8th. Around the same time that the hostel manager audibly witnessed Brian physically abusing Yvonne, someone was walking past the hostel and they heard a fight and they visually witnessed Brian strangling Yvonne. While strangling her, Brian was heard saying, I'm going to kill you. Again, it's unclear if this was ever reported to authorities. Still, during the investigation, more witnesses from Panama provided firsthand information about Brian's behavior after Yvonne went missing. You see, Brian started hitting up women on Isla Caranera to go party with him at the bars. Brian was buying copious amounts of alcohol and cocaine. And get this, this jack wagon was bragging to these people that he was paying for the party with money that he took out of Yvonne's bank account. He also told people that he was positive that Yvonne was never coming back. After Yvonne's disappearance, Brian told various versions of what happened to Yvonne, all of them having to do with her running off to Costa Rica with some guy named Tony Gonzalez. He told some people Yvonne and Tony met online. He told others the two of them met at a bar. Brian told stories about Tony owning a yacht and having money and blah, blah, blah. Yvonne's family was so distraught with the information they were learning from their PI in Panama. And then in June of 2013, nearly two years after Yvonne Baldelli disappeared without a trace, her older sister Michelle got a text message from her father. The text message simply read, they got the SOB. Brian Brimiger had been arrested by the FBI. Brian was indicted by a federal grand jury in San Diego on charges that he obstructed justice and made a false statement to law enforcement during the investigation of Yvonne Baldelli's disappearance. Brian was charged with 13 felonies involving his efforts to cover up Yvonne's death. The obstruction charges could send him to jail for 20 years on each count and a $250,000 fine. And the false statement could get him another five years and another $250,000 fine. At this time, it should be noted that Brian was not charged with murder. Assistant U.S. attorneys Shane Harrigan and Mark Conover said that without a body, they didn't have enough to bring a murder charge. But that was all about to change. <laughs> In what could only be described as a pure miracle, on August 21st, 2013, 21 months after Yvonne's disappearance, a field worker was clearing brush in Panama and came across a military duffel bag. The field worker could see that there was something inside this bag. He cut open the top of the bag and made a shocking discovery. 
Inside the duffel bag were skeletonized remains. As the worker looked around, he spotted two more garbage bags and inside those bags were more bones. The worker immediately notified the authorities. A DNA test was performed on the human remains left behind in the Panamanian jungle and they were a match to their missing expat. Nearly two years after she was last seen alive, Yvonne Baldelli's remains were found. Special Agent Masters wanted to be the one to tell Yvonne's sister, Michelle Valenzuela. You see, Michelle had been such a force in getting answers about what had happened to her sister. The autopsy was truly heartbreaking. The results revealed that Yvonne had literally died from being stabbed in the back twice. Now let that sink in. Some of the other injuries noted in the autopsy report were Yvonne's nose and teeth were crushed in. Her femur was broken and there were cut marks on the bones consistent with those that would be made with a machete. The evidence against Brian Bremiger was mounting. Evidence that included pictures of Brian and Yvonne with the identical duffel bag she was found in. Evidence of domestic violence. Evidence that Brian was doing everything in his power to make everyone believe that Yvonne had run off even though her body had just been found within walking distance from their hostel. The thing is that everything was so dense in that area that the family had been searching near where Yvonne was ultimately found. As if Yvonne's parents, Jim and Lillian Falk, hadn't gone through hell and high water for two years trying to find their daughter. At this point, they were dealt another devastating blow. During her fight for justice for her sister, Their fierce daughter, Michelle Valenzuela, had ignored a lump on her breast and she was ultimately diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer by the spring of 2014. Michelle told 48 Hours, I'm still alive to fight for my life and I'm still alive to fight for my sister. Michelle's physical transformation from the start of the 48 Hours episode to the end of it was dramatic. By the end of the episode, Michelle was thin. She had lost almost all of her hair, but you could still see the fight in her eyes. Cancer was taking her fast. By September of 2014, Michelle was given only a few weeks to live, yet she was a crucial part of the trial. So at that point, they decided to record her testimony via an emergency deposition. And at that deposition, Brian would be sitting right across from Michelle. Michelle acknowledged her impending death, saying this might be the last thing I get to do for her over and over and over again because it will be on camera forever. When Michelle came in to provide her testimony, she did her very best to ignore Brian and she spoke as clearly as she could in her weakened condition. You can actually watch some of this deposition in the 48 Hours episode and it was very hard to watch, but Michelle was so brave and she showed Brian just how much She loved her sister, but this testimony was very exhausting for Michelle. After the deposition, she was wheeled back to her room. She asked the DA how she did, and when they told her she did good, she fell asleep and never regained consciousness. Just days later, Michelle died, but she was right. Her testimony was captured on film forever, and Brian couldn't take that from her, and her testimony could be used against him at trial should push come to shove. Everyone loves a good family mystery, especially one with as many twists and turns as June's Journey. When you play June's Journey, you immerse yourself into the role of June Parker and you search for hidden clues to uncover the mystery of her sister's murder. While playing, you get to spark your observation skills to quickly uncover key pieces of information or as us True Crime Army members like to say, evidence that lead from one mystery to another. As you move through the chapters, you get to immerse yourself in a mystery of danger and romance. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery mobile game that puts your detective skills to the test with hundreds, and I mean hundreds of beautifully detailed scenes set in the 1920s, there is no chance that you will get bored. June's Journey is sure to spark your True Crime Army's inner detective, because we all love to play detective and find clues. And who doesn't love a good scandalous family secret? I mean, we really don't want any of it, but once it's there, we want to know all the details. And June Parker's family has tons of family secrets, more than abuelas telenovelas. 
uncover the mystery of June's sister's murder. Can you crack the case? I know you can do it. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android devices. I can't be the only one who loves to look at jewelry online. Well, I found my new favorite jewelry store, Brilliant Earth. They say diamonds are a girl's best friend, and they are not lying. What I love about Brilliant Earth Jewelry is that it offers a wide selection of custom settings. You can add a lab or a natural diamond or a gemstone, and it's all available from the comfort of your home. But if you're the type that like to see jewelry in person, Brilliant Earth has over 30 showrooms across the U.S. So what's a girl to do when she can create a custom ring? She creates a custom ring. Right now, I am obsessing over something I had never seen before. Brilliant Earth offers gorgeous hidden halos that are beneath the main setting of the ring, and it really makes any engagement ring pop. But I also love their nature-inspired willow ring, which adds diamond-filled leaves on the side of the main diamond. I love it. What I love most about Brilliant Earth, however, is that they go beyond conflict-free by only accepting diamonds from specific mine operations and countries that follow internationally recognized labor, trade, and environmental standards. That way, you can shop knowing that you are not contributing to any child labor violations or rebel movements. And what's even more impressive is that less than 1% of diamond suppliers worldwide meet Brilliant Earth's ethical standards. Whether you're in the market for an engagement ring or just any type of fine jewelry, like a layered necklace, or stacked rings, you need to check out Brilliant Earth. Check out all their beautiful pieces at BrilliantEarth.com. That's BrilliantEarth.com. The case against Brian Brimmiger was a tricky one. He was a U.S. citizen who was suspected of killing another U.S. citizen in a foreign country. The foreign murder statute that covers this case is 18 U.S.C. 1119, and it is defined as follows. A person who, being a national of the U.S., kills or attempts to kill a national of the U.S. while such national is outside the U.S. but within the jurisdiction of another country shall be punished as provided under sections 1111, 1112, and 1113. And those sections provide language for the punishments that include the death penalty, life imprisonment for first-degree murder, life imprisonment or any terms of years or life for second-degree murder, And it also lays out involuntary manslaughter and attempted murder and attempted manslaughter. Assistant U.S. Attorney Mark Conover stated, quote, We came to the conclusion that the only way that Brian Brimmiger would face justice for his murderous act is if he was charged and convicted here in the United States. And of course, since the crime occurred in Panama for the U.S. to try him here in the U.S., the Panamanian government needed to approve the request. And with the request in early 2015, the Panamanian government agreed to allow the U.S. to try Brian for murder on American soil. In fact, the Panamanian officials stated that they would extradite Brian back to Panama to face trial there if the U.S. didn't try him. Brian's defense team immediately filed to have the entire indictment dismissed because obviously they were saying he hadn't tried to obstruct justice. Not surprisingly, that motion was immediately denied. The defense next went about trying to revoke his pretrial detention, meaning he was trying to be released pending trial. And his wife, Kristen, wrote a letter on his behalf outlining what an amazing citizen Brian was. She touted his academic record, his involvement coaching youth soccer, and his decorated career in the Marines. And then she added the best one of all, his leadership at church. The pretrial detention dismissal motion was denied. The court agreed with the prosecution that Brian was a flight risk and a danger to society. In August of 2015, Brian's defense team attempted to have the charge of first degree foreign murder of a United States national dismissed. They tried to claim that Panama had the ability to make him return to their country and should have disqualified the U.S. from prosecuting him. That motion was also denied. Meanwhile, back in Panama, private investigator Don Winner discovered information for the investigation that was nothing short of amazing. He found a Facebook page where the hostel manager was selling Bryant's machete for him. Someone who was interested in buying it commented on the post and asked the manager if she was the original owner. On January 4th, Brian jumped into the Facebook conversation and commented back, quote, it actually used to be mine. I brought it down with me when I came down from the States. Okay, true crime army, 
Here is where we know he's a stone cold killer. Brian finishes off this very public Facebook comment by stating, quote, don't worry, I only dismembered one stripper with it. It is hardly used, end quote. And then he added a winky face emoji. What in the actual hell is wrong with people? The thing is that once you realize that someone is a liar, you see that there is so much truth to their so-called jokes. Once you notice this, it could make you sick to your stomach. Don sent his findings of this Facebook page to special agent masters who knew he needed to get his hands on the machete. Agent Masters tracked down the person that Brian had sold the machete to, and it was turned into the FBI. As soon as the machete was received, they tested it for any blood evidence that might remain on it. But the lab didn't find any blood evidence whatsoever on the machete blade. But then the machete blade sat in evidence for over a year until they were getting ready for trial. And as they were looking at the machete, they realized something. The machete's handle had three screws in it, holding it to the blade. The lab removed the screws and under the handle, they found what looked like blood. The substance was tested and it came back positive for blood. Not just that, but a DNA test confirmed the blood belonged to Yvonne Baldelli. Brian, you see, had cleaned the blade but Yvonne's blood had gotten under the handle and that Brian missed. Brian's fate at this point appeared to be sealed. Once his attorney learned of the evidence and shared that with Brian, he realized the jig was up. He wasn't going to lie his way out of this one. Within a week, Brian changed his plea to guilty of second degree murder and all of the other charges were dropped as part of the plea agreement. During the plea process, Brian confessed not only to killing Yvonne, but he also killed her dog, Georgia May, too. So this is how everything actually went down, according to Brian. On the night of November 26, 2011, Yvonne and Brian left the hostel they were staying at and headed out to dinner at Carlos's steakhouse. The owner of the hostel had recently broken her leg and she was in the hospital, she had asked Brian and Yvonne to watch the place for her. No one else was in the hostel when the couple returned after dinner, so no one was there to hear what was about to happen. Late that night, Brian and Yvonne got into an argument after Yvonne discovered that Brian had fathered a child with his ex-girlfriend. Brian claimed that Yvonne then pulled a knife on him and a struggle ensued. The struggle ended when Brian crushed Yvonne's nose, smashed her teeth, and ultimately stabbed Yvonne in the back at least twice. After killing Yvonne, Brian dragged Yvonne's body into the shower where he took a weighted machete to her body and dismembered her. The machete was a monstrously long knife with two edges. One side was sharp and the other side of the blade was a saw. After dismembering her body, Brian took Yvonne's upper body and stuffed it into a military duffel bag. It was the kind that troops are issued at boot camp. Then Brian shoved her legs into two separate garbage bags. He then gathered the three bags and set out for a 1.5 mile hike across the island to a remote area. Brian threw the bags containing Yvonne's body and legs down an embankment in the jungle, thinking he had just committed the perfect crime. He hiked back to the hostel, telling himself, oh, no one was ever going to find Yvonne's remains in the middle of the jungle. Hours after disposing of her remains, Brian sent an email to his friend that said, Hey bro, what you up to? I got stories for days. I'm living on an island off the coast of Panama, loving life and living semper free. The day after Yvonne's murder on November 27th, 2011, Brian started weaving an elaborate ruse to make people think Yvonne had run off with another man. The first thing he did was send an email from her email account using Yvonne's laptop to her friends and family saying that she had broken up with Brian and was moving to Costa Rica with a new man named Tony Gonzalez. In order to make the story about moving look legit to Yvonne's family, Brian took her ATM card and withdrew cash, like kind of like a lot of cash, to make it look like she was really on her way to Costa Rica. He also bagged up all of Yvonne's clothes, her makeup, her jewelry, in 10 large trash bags 
and left them on the dock outside of the hostel to be picked up as garbage. And there was evidence of the murder that Brian had to get rid of inside of the hostel, including the bloody mattress where he stabbed Yvonne. He purchased a new mattress and threw the bloody one into the ocean. Brian used Yvonne's laptop and her email account again to email the hostel manager. Brian took his ruse one step further and even sent an email from his account to Yvonne's email account to make it look like he thought she had left Panama. Brian gathered his stuff and made plans to return to California to be with Kristen. He booked his trip to leave Panama on December 11th, but he included a two-day stop in San Jose, Costa Rica. He added the stop in Costa Rica to corroborate his story about Yvonne leaving him because while he was there, he used Yvonne's ATM card again to make another cash withdrawal of $200. He was going all out to make it believable that she had really moved to Costa Rica. Brian used Yvonne's laptop to search for Festival de la Luz, then wrote a draft email to Yvonne's sister saying that she and her new boyfriend, Tony Gonzalez, were having a great time at the Festival de la Luz in San Jose and that they were going to come to the United States in January of 2010. For some reason, however, he never sent that email and it just sat in his drafts. And it was when Brian returned to the United States without Yvonne that his story began to unravel. Brian's sentencing hearing was scheduled for May 25th, 2016. Brian Brimmiger was permitted to make a statement to the family. He attempted to apologize, but the family wasn't hearing it. They told him, don't look at us, and they scoffed, sure, in response. The family was given time to tell Brian and the court how Yvonne's disappearance and her murder affected them. They spoke of the emotional and physical suffering they felt, the horrible way she was killed, and the torture of not knowing where Yvonne was. One family member told the court, quote, Today we got an apology, a hollow last minute attempt to save himself. Last night we talked about forgiveness, but forgiveness is for those who repent, not for those who cover their crimes, not for those who confess only when their backs are against the wall, end quote. Yvonne's family spoke in detail about how they searched the muddy and spider-infested swamps in the Panamanian jungle, how they were afraid to find her, but also afraid to not find her. A U.S. district judge sentenced Brian Brimager to 26 years in prison, stating, quote, This murder was particularly cruel and depraved. The lengths Mr. Brimager went to to avoid detection were particularly brazen and ultimately shattering to the Bardelli family. Fox 5 reported that the judge justified giving Brian the lighter 26-year sentence rather than life in prison by stating, quote, no matter how heinous the crime, this is a man who has served his country for seven years, going on numerous tours, including Iraq, where he fought for his country. He also had a minimal criminal record, end quote. The judge continued, quote, you also have to look at the nature of their relationship. It was a stormy, tumultuous relationship marked by mutual domestic violence. It was dysfunctional, fueled by excessive consumption of drugs and alcohol, end quote. I watched the True Crime Online documentary on this case, and it appeared that people in Panama corroborated Brian's story that there was mutual combat between the couple. Yvonne was described as jealous, and she would push Brian in public if he got too close to other women. It was even revealed that a few days before the murder during an argument, Yvonne allegedly attacked Brian by hitting him in the back with his laptop. It was when the laptop broke that the couple began to share a computer, and that was when Yvonne discovered that Brian had been emailing Kristen, and it came as a shock to her to learn that Brian had fathered a child with Kristen. There was an argument about that on November 26th, that Brian revealed ultimately led to her death. As part of his sentence, Brian was also ordered to pay $11,132 in restitution to Yvonne's family, and there was a $10,000 fine. While it was a disappointment that he didn't get life, Yvonne's family was happy that he was being locked away. U.S. Attorney Laura Duffy stated, quote, 
The day of reckoning has come for Brian Bremiger. Not only did he show a callous disregard for Yvonne Baldelli's life by viciously beating, dabbing, dismembering, and dumping her in the jungle, but his words and actions in the hours, days, and months following his horrendous crime exhibited an extreme lack of remorse. He stole a precious daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, and now he's paying the price, end quote. The case was finally settled, and Yvonne's remains were returned to her family. She was cremated, and her ashes were laid to rest at sea by her family. Yvonne's dad, Jim Fowl, stated, quote, to get her remains back and be able to give her a justified resting place, I can sleep better at night knowing that she's not rotting in some jungle or deep in the ocean somewhere. Yvonne's stepmom, Lillian Faust, told 48 Hours, quote, we brought her home. And I know that that was thanks to a lot of work of a lot of unsung heroes. I know, end quote. Brian is now serving his sentence at Big Spring Federal Correctional Institute in Texas. His release date is scheduled to be in August of 2035. And before I go, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Kristen, Brian's wife. Kristen was believing whatever BS Brian had been feeding her during the trial. When 48 Hours tried to ask her if she still believed in his innocence, Kristen's mom held her hand up to the camera and blocked the shot. You know, kind of like talk to the hand. As of the time 48 Hours published Yvonne's story, Kristen was still supporting Brian and visiting him in prison. That was in January of 2017. And a lot can happen in that time, you know. But I couldn't find anything saying that they weren't together anymore. Before I sign off, I did want to point out that when Yvonne's computer evidence was examined, they found a draft letter with Kristen's name on it, revealing Yvonne's relationship with Brian in Panama. The prosecution really believes to this day that Brian killed Yvonne because he was not going to allow her to ruin his plans to return to Kristen. Sadly, with the plea, they accepted the deal and the sentence was set based on what Brian was willing to admit, a mutual fight that ended in death. Thank you so much, True Crime Army, for joining me for another episode. Next week, I will be releasing a bonus episode on Patreon and Apple Premium. So if you're interested in checking out that bonus content, be sure to visit patreon.com slash military murder or visit my Apple Premium subscription page on Apple Podcasts. Quick shout out to Myrtle for rocking and researching and writing this episode for me. The sources for this episode include FBI.gov, Case Text, Case Mind, Fox 5, The Washington Post, an episode of 48 Hours, an episode of Crime Online, The Costa Rica Star, The Federal Bureau of Prisons, Inmate Finder, Find a Grave, and Facebook. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions. This month's executive producers are Myrtle, Jen, Tina, Alicia, Bob, Falcon 13, and Nicole. Holler to my newest associate producers, Margot and D. Gates Cat, and my newest assistant producer, Megan. The music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next time. I was working on her podcast. I don't want to.